Hello and welcome to my talk about development tool automation. Uh, like Jake, I'm not as good as the fluffy, at the fluffy stuff, so I'm going to do just one of the things that like, I've learned ha the hard way during my work, and I'm sharing it with you. So I hope this is an uh, appropriate ending of this uh, really nice event. My name is Jan Lehnert. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Neighborhood Software in Berlin. And we're, doing, <coughs> or we're behind such illustrious projects as Hoodie, Apache, CouchDB. We have started the offline first movement. I'm one of the organizers of JS ConfiU, Europe's other great JavaScript conference. And uh, some of you may know we have taken a break in 2016 with JS ConfiU. And it's really great to see that the JavaScript community came together here to put up another event um, to provide everyone with all the, the, the talks and the getting together that the community needs. So thank you very much for this. Um, it is an honor and privilege to speak here. Um, and um, I, I guess that's just it. It's just an honor and privilege to, sp to speak here. I'll just leave it at that. <coughs> um, Hoodie is an open source, offline first, backend for front end web apps. Um, when you're all hooked on the progressive web app stuff that Jake is tired of talking about, Hoodie is sort of the next stage for you. It allows you to do offline data synchronization, not just have your assets and some of the, the data that you have offline, but have full offline data synchronization that actually works. But this talk isn't about Hoodie. Um, it's more of a talk about the things that we learned while doing Hoodie uh, and how I think or I believe that these things are applicable to more than just open source projects or just our open source project. When we started out with Hoodie, it was just two people. Uh, it was not a lot of code. It was easy to keep it all in your head and work on it and make releases and all of that. <coughs> Today, Hoodie is 108 contributors. Um, and I'll show you two of the magic tricks that helped us to scale our JavaScript development. While we've made the journey through Hoodie, or through an open source project in Hoodie, I believe that the things that we've learned are not only applicable to open source projects, but to commercial and enterprise projects as well. Um, the umbrella term for all of this is modularization. This is a really big topic, ironically, um, but uh, I'm only talking about a tiny aspect of this, so there's a lot more discussion going on. So don't just, like, don't just listen to what I say and think modularization is great. Of course, there's lots of other trade-offs, but I'm talking about a few things here, so modularization. When we started out, Hoodie Server looked like this, one big monolith of thing. And when you start out, building a monolith is usually the right thing to do. <coughs> then, we, um, then we figured out through having this, there's actually a bunch of components in there. An accounts module, so you can just sign in, sign up, log in, that kind of stuff. An email module that should be self-explanatory, some payment gateway interface stuff, uh, and of course, the famous offline store um, component. Um, so eventually, we moved those to distinct uh, modules. So it looks more like this. And in reality today, most of these are multiple modules in themselves too. Um, and we've immediately started seeing the benefits of smaller, well-defined modules. It was easier to, for people to get started contributing a new feature, for example. Um, somebody did password forget for accounts. And all they had to do was learn the internals of the accounts module and the API of the email module. And not every, anything else, nothing about the store, nothing about the payments, <coughs> and nothing about the overall architecture of Hoodie Server. Um, and the, the, over, like the, the meta thing here is um, less scope. More scope, <laughs> the, the opposite of this, more scope is the death of all software. So less scope is the life of all software, I guess. Um, the, the idea here is that you have smaller distinct pieces of functionality that are easier to understand, uh, easier to reason about, I said the thing, um, easier to, um, to keep in your head and work on. Um, <coughs> and easier, in our case, to get contributors in. Um, they're also easier to document. One of the things that software always lacks is so documentation, and especially internal documentation. If, your module, if you have a module where this long a readme with a bit of API, bit of architecture, bit of internals, and a bit of where this is going is enough, it's much more likely to be written. So you actually have documentation for stuff. Uh, this is very important for a uh, newcomer to the project. It's also easier to test. Some of you may be familiar with really big test suites that randomly fail <coughs> source labs. And um, that <laughs> is really annoying uh, if, for working on code. So smaller code bases make, make for smaller test suites that are easier to work on. I'm very sorry for the source labs people. <laughs> but they're dear friends. I'm, I think I'm, I'm allowed to make the joke. Um, and all of this makes things easier to contribute to. And this is good for Hoodie. But, um, 
if, if you have a new contributor coming to an open source project, or if you're coming back to a project after three months while doing something else, that's the same person. Like, you're essentially the new contributor, and you'll be thanking your former self for writing that readme, for writing that, uh, the, the small test suite. And um, this moving there, or trying this out with this first level of modularization, was such a revolutionary transformation for us that we went all out on it. Today, Hoodie is 50 plus repos on GitHub, and everything's great. Hooray. Hooray. So it's a brave new world with all the modules. Uh, is that, is, aren't there any issues with this? Is this fine? Um, um, there are there are different pri are there priorities for, uh, for an open source project, for maintainers of open source projects. And here the, here's the top three, in my opinion. The number one is set direction. Where's this pro what, what does it do and where is it going? Number two, empower contributions, get more people in. Um, I think we did this with the, that was the goal of the modularization. That works fine. And number three, make sure nobody burns out and nobody leaves the project. It's really easy to see. New people come in, nobody leaves, you have a healthy growing open source project. What we were doing in reality, though, <laughs> is number one, release one of the sub-modules. Number two, update an intermediate module on all the intermediate modules. Number three, update the top-level module. That is not very good priorities for an open source project. Uh, especially the last point for the top three earlier, the not burning out. If you're the maintainer, and all the, th uh, the only thing that you do is this, that's not very fun. So you'll be, you'll be out of there really quickly. And also, it takes forever for contributions of open source, uh, for contributors to have their contributions end up in the top-level project, and that um, leaves us out in a very important uh, thing in open-source development, the instant gratification loop that keeps people engaged. Um, that's why we have REPL, so we see like, things really quickly. And if you can build this into your open-source workflow, somebody, somebody's pull request gets merged, there's going to be a release uh, really quickly after that. They're going to be engaged more. <coughs> so we went back to the drawing board. And I'm focusing on two specific things here that we were looking for. The one is releases, and the one is updates. And before I get there, I have to make a really quick detour and talk about semantic versioning. And don't everybody run away at once. <laughs> so I know you all know this. This is a quick recap, just so we get some vocabulary uh, down here so we can you know, go through the rest of the slides. You've all seen this. It's a version number. Um, and semantic versioning assigns semantics to these version numbers. They exp it explains what these numbers mean. And by the way, these are three integers. There's no floats going on or so, if you think about that, it's integers. Um, but maybe it's easier to understand what they mean when we assign words to them, because humans are better at words. We call them breaking feature and fix. So let's run through an example really quickly. Um, when you start out with a new module, it gets the version number 100. That's how you always start, 100. Um, you made a bug, somebody reported it, <coughs> you fix it, release a new version, it's the 101. We bump the fixed version. Um, we introduce a new feature, we get a 110, um, the, the fixed version gets bumped down to zero. Um, we introduce a new, f new bug with a new feature, fix it, 11, another feature, 112. And then we introduce a breaking change. We introduce a 2.0, and we release a 2.0. And this is absolutely critical. You have to bump the breaking version number when you make a breaking change to your software. People keep using the version numbers for marketing reasons and inducing breaking changes in between, and that just leads to pain for everyone that we don't really need. So let, just let me say it again. You absolutely have to bump the breaking version number if your update breaks your user's code. Absolutely. Um, in other terms, version numbers are for computers and release names are for humans. This is really, really important. Um, we Germans famously have a word for everything, and they tend to be long words. So here's the word for the fear of increasing the breaking version number. It's Hauptversionsnummerhörungsangst, obviously. <laughs> and we all have it. I have it too. It's very hard to overcome. Right, let's see a few photos. I'll wait for the photos. One more. <laughs> One more. All right, I think, oh, it's a latecomer. Okay, okay, we're done. Um, so, again, semantic versioning is this whole nice world, and it would be great if we could all just, like, use it, <coughs> but there are downsides as well. Uh, or there are many reasons why it fails. And all of the reasons why semantic versioning fails are human reasons. Because, unfortunately, as you probably already know, we can't trust people. We can't even trust ourselves. We constantly squabble about what constitutes a bug fix or a breaking change. 
is fixing code to match the documented behavior a breaking change or not? Uh, what if somebody started relying on the buggy behavior? Uh, the famous story from the 90s is a version of like, Windows 98 had to detect which process is running, for example, SimCity, that was relying on a Windows 95 bug that had, when SimCity is running, have the buggy behavior, but have the correct behavior for everyone else. And Windows is full of this in every other operating system as well. So this is obviously terrible. So let's take humans out of the equation and trust machines to do the work for us. Um, I'll introduce to you two simple tools that help you get going with this. Um, and to get going with the first one, let's go through a typical NPM uh, workflow. Um, NPM install, I think we've all done this. Um, this is very easy. One of the cornerstones of NPM is that this is easy. This is good. Another cornerstone is that this is easy. NPM publish. Show of hands, who here has done this? All right, who here has never done this? All right, despite of the things I'll tell you in a minute, we'll get you there. This is really fun to do. So. Um, there's a, f there's a few more things that you have to consider when you do NPM publish. For example, you want to have a corresponding git tag on GitHub or in your source control. So did you git tag this correctly? Next, uh, <laughs> next step, did we push the tags correctly? Because git push by default doesn't push any new tags. Um, by the way, these are all mistakes that I frequently have made and continue to make. <laughs> uh, this isn't just like some harebrained scheme. It's like, this is stuff that I get wrong all the time. Um, when you put a new version number into package.json and then did npm publish and do the git tag, did you think of committing the package.json? <laughs> because I usually don't. <laughs> um, and then like, the big one, of course, is did we pick the right version number? And I already said we were really bad at this, so I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail about this. And then most importantly, uh, making a new module, a new package is communicating change. So did we write a change log? And that's kind of not happening. This. We have to do this every time we release a new module. And now we have like 50 plus modules. Every time we do a re like something new happens, we have to do this. This is a repetitive, error-prone process that we should totally automate. Humans shouldn't be doing this, because what we actually care about is build cool things and don't break stuff. That's, that's what we really want. So we built a tool called Semantic Release. Um, this is how you get started, npm install dash g semantic release CLI, and then you go into your project folder, say semantic release CLI setup, it gets you, goes you through a little bit of a thing, and then, um, then you're good to go. And this is what the workflow now looks. You make a git commit, uh, we're fixing an off by one error, good job there, catching that, and you see we have fix colon in the beginning, we have a special tag in the beginning. Um, next thing we do, a uh, new feature, our, our app got popular, people have more than 1,000 items, we start supporting more than 1,000 items, so we put in feature or feed colon and then the, the commit message. Good. Next, another fix, better error handling, but it's a breaking change. Uh, clients must now understand the new error format that we had. And now we do git push. I now remember uh, the workflow previously. Choose the right version number. Okay, there's a fix, there's a feed, there's another fix, but it's a breaking change. So which of the what do they have to look like? Right. We have to commit the package JSON. <laughs> we have to apply the correct git tag. Make sure we push that tag correctly. Um, and all of this is with semantic reads. All of this done is with the git push. That's it. You're done. Everything else is handled by a friendly robot. This is what it looks like. Um, you see in Hoodie we are frivolous with major version numbers, you should be too. Uh, we're also frivolous with releases in general, so our change log is usually only ever like one change uh, because we want to have contributors um, uh, work in the public really quickly. Um, but if you have a package that uh, batches uh, commits for releases, you have a really nice different sections in the change log, it's really good for you. So here's how it works. This is the, uh, these are the three constituents of JavaScript development, GitHub, Travis, and NPM. And we start with a git push locally, We're pushing to GitHub. GitHub then notifi notifies your CI server, hey, here's some new code. Uh, the CI server runs your tests. And then semantic release runs on your CI server, determines, uh, looks at all the uh, commits that you have, fix, feed, feed, fix, fix, breaking, looks at the previous version number, and from that calculates what the next version number must be. There's no human there making that decision anymore. Right? Computers are better with this. Um, when semantic release figures out what the number is, it does, uh, puts it into the package JSON, does the npm publish, does the git tag, pushes the tags, and does everything for you. And you're done. This is a repeatable process that works every time. This is very, very good. Um, thank you. <laughs> so
So going over this quickly, there are a few options. Um, if you don't agree with the tags in the beginning, um, there's a standard for commit messages. Of course there is. So there's a group of people who are writing commit message parsers and agree on a standard of how to formalize, this, formalize that. Um, so you can hook in other parsers if you have a different scheme going on. Uh, there's a thing called release constraints. It's a bit of a plugin architecture. So if you don't want to have release for every commit, you can have like a once a day, once a week, every 10 or whatever. Like you can put in custom constraints to when to release. And then the fun one, this is ex um, ex not accidental, experimental support for breaking change detection. This is when you forgot to put a breaking change in where you should have. Um, and our demo um, uh, checks out your previous version's test suite and runs it against the current version. And if that breaks, you have a breaking change that you didn't document, and semantic release will refuse to do a, do a release for you uh, until you uh, document the breaking change. Um, if you're using like type annotations or Elm or TypeScript or have any other way to detect whether you're not no longer API compatible, um, then you can use those. It's a lot easier than uh, running the test suite thing, but uh, that, that can be hooked in there as well. All right, semantic release is free and open source. You can start using it now, or at least after this talk. All right, time for me to have a drink. Mm. Now we're on the other side. Uh, we have a lot of modules that have a lot of releases and a lot of dependencies, so like a big dependency tree, and we have to handle updates. And for, for Hoodie, again, it's very obvious why we want those. Um, again, the work bubbles up to the top really quickly. But there's other reasons for staying up to date. <coughs> and Guy talked about this yesterday with, uh, with all the security stuff that hopefully get you scared properly. Uh, so you stay up to date with everything, start using Snake as well. Um, so for bug fix and security updates, obviously always want to stay up to date, not only for your own dependencies, but everyone else as well. So look at them. Look at this. Typical package chase and about 20 dependencies. Mm. So for all of these, this is the process for keeping dependencies up to date. So the first one is ours, so um, maybe this is easiest. Let's start with the second one then. Go to the GitHub page, see if there's a new release, review the commits and the changelog to see if there's anything that we should be scared about, run, uh, update the version number, run the tests locally, fix any issues. And we go to the next one. Go to the GitHub page, see if there's a new release, review the commits if there are any issues we can have about, Nobody does this, right? <laughs> Nobody does this. It's way too complicated, too much work. But that also means most people's software is either broken or insecure. That is also very terrible. Um, and there's some tooling around this. NPM outdated gives you a nice list or lets you update them all at once. But then if your, up if your update breaks, you don't know which of the updates. Uh, sorry, if your the tests break, you don't know which of the updates broke the tests. And if you do it manually, when do you do it? Uh, every day? Every week? Before release? After a release? There's so much to get wrong and uh, to forget. Um, so show of hands, who here does NPM updates on a fixed schedule? Two hands. <laughs> Good. <laughs> QED. Um, so if you don't do anything, like if you don't put this into process, this may as well doesn't happen at all. Um, so of course, this is a, the long intro to using the right tool because what we really care about is what is new, is it safe to update, and does a breaking change affect me? That's the things I care about. None of the other things that I have to do to get there. So welcome Greenkeeper. This is another thing that we're doing that I didn't mention in the intro. This is how you get started. npm install g Greenkeeper. Uh, go to a module or a packet or project um, say Greenkeeper enable, and that's it. Greenkeeper is a service that creates pull requests for dependency updates as they occur. This is what it looks like. Uh, here's semantic release is a developer dependency of Greenkeeper itself. Got a new version. We have a little note in there that this version isn't covered by our current version range. Um, and we have a little bit of a section there with release notes and commits. So we pull in the, these from the dependencies. So you can like, expand this and see this is the change log for the bug fixes that happened in the release that I'm about to merge. Um, you can also look at the commits that happened. In case, like, this is semantic release, which is itself using semantic release, so we know every commit ends up in the change log. But if you have projects that don't use it, you can see if any of the commits uh, do something that isn't mentioned in the change log. So everything is there. All the chores are taken care of for you. The only thing you have to do is to decide whether to do the merge or not. Um, and when you're, um, when you're happy with this, you can do the merge. So how does this work? Um, here are the four constituents of JavaScript development again, Greenkeeper, GitHub, Travis, and NPM. And I'll show you the simplified version first, um, and then show you how it actually works, because that's, that way is simpler. 
So NPM is built famously on CouchDB, and CouchDB has this really nifty feature that not a lot of people know about. It's called the changes feed, and it's like Git log, but for your database. And in NPM's case, it shows the list of all the module versions that have ever been published. And it's an HTTP endpoint that you can subscribe to for real-time updates. Um, so that's exactly what Greenkeeper does. You, and anyone in the world runs NPM publish, Greenkeeper gets a, pu a push or a push notification from NPM. Greenkeeper then opens a pull request on GitHub, like we just saw. GitHub notifies uh, Travis or CI uh, to run your tests. Um, uh, Travis reports back the, the PR status, red or green, and reports it back to GitHub, and then we can decide whether to merge it or not. Okay, now how it really works, because uh, you may already have seen issues with this one. Um, start is the same, new package version, Greenkeeper gets notified, but then Greenkeeper creates a branch, or a pull request, a branch. Um, GitHub still notifies Travis, and Travis still runs the tests and reports the branch status back, and now GitHub does a, uh, sorry, Greenkeeper does a clever thing. If the new, newly updated version is within your version range and the tests are green, then it just deletes the branch because we just have proven that we have a version range, the new version doesn't break your update, everybody gets the new version. Semantic versioning has been done correctly. There's no need to get, in, to get you involved, just delete the branch. If you're outside the range or if the update fails, you get a pull request. Um, so you get to decide what to do with the update. Um, this is a repeatable process that works every time. And the choice, again, the choice are all taken away from you and you're always in a position to make the actual, like the, the, what humans are good at, make a judgment of whether we should do the update now or not. We have a new feature um, that we just released uh, last month. Uh, we update your Travis YAML file when new versions of Node come out. So you immediately test again new versions of Node, but also we delete or we remove or we offer you to remove node versions that are no longer supported. So this was a good Halloween pull request for us. Um, you may have seen uh, projects or tweets about projects that show there are a lot of open pull requests for open source projects and that's really annoying. Sometimes multiple uh, pull requests per dependency like for each update and sometimes like Babel has like seven updates in a day and there's seven pull requests and it's really annoying. Um, we changed this recently as well. We have a new version of Greenkeeper out that opens an issue per dependency and updates that issue instead of opening new pull requests. And now it does a really clever thing that I want to show here. So for example, this module introduces a breaking change. Um, and it gives you, uh, sorry, then does a, it, uh, Greenkeeper does the clever thing that Greenkeeper does. It, it detects the previously still working version of the dependency, so the, version, the previous version that still worked, that we know worked for you, that we proved the test suite passed. Um, and then we give you this really nice link over here into a pull request that pins that dependency to the last working version. So you can decide, like, I know the new one is broken, but I have no time to fix this right now, so pin it to the one that we know worked, and then we can address this later, the issue stays open. This link takes you to a pull request that pins the version, and uh, it's really, like, it's really convenient for you to do if you, if you can't just, like, just can't handle the update right now because we understand not everybody can do be updating all the time. What we want to do next is uh, identify and remove a lot more chores. So if you have anything that annoys you during development, let me know because then we can automate this for you. Uh, we want to give you more flexibility. Again, GitHub use, uh, sorry, Greenkeeper uses a specific commit message format. Some people don't like this, so we want to make this more flexible, of course. And one of the things I'm most excited about is what we call the breakage forecast for package maintainers. So say, uh, so, um, maybe you know, uh, NPM lets you publish things in different channels. And that's usually, a, the, the default is a stable channel. That's the release that everybody gets with NPM install. And then uh, some projects do a next or beta channel to have like pre-release software that other people can use. Um, and you have to like um, install the specific version number to get this. This is usually people closer to the project doing this. Um, so what we want to do is say Lodash has a next channel and publishes a new version. Then we look at all the top modules that depend on Lodash and run their current test suite with the updated Lodash version. And if that breaks, we can tell Lodash, the Lodash maintainer, if we can open an issue, hey, JDD, you broke the Ember build in your beta channel, maybe address this somehow or talk with the Ember people so they can fix that before your update gets the stable tag. Um, this, um, this is just one of the things that we really care about at Greenkeeper, stability in the N NPM ecosystem overall, uh, but also for you all individually. So you can, you can actually, like the, 
taking the human, humans out of the, the semantic versioning equation and make all the software a lot more reliable and a lot more stable for you. Um, there are about 10,000 projects on GitHub that already use Greenkeeper. Some such illustrious clients as Lodash, Request, PouchDB, Karma, Modernizer, Standard, WebTorrent, Mustache.js, Google's AM and HTML5 boilerplate. Um, you can join them today. Uh, Greenkeeper is a service. It's free for open source. It's also one private repo for free. And while the, the current, like the new version that I just showed with the issues that uses a new GitHub API that is in beta, so we're also in beta, so currently even private stuff is free, but don't tell anyone. Um, but we'll eventually charge you for this one. Um, while I'm talking about open source, and this is how I want to close, um, all the benefits that we worked out from tiny modules and the things that we, how we solve working with tiny modules, aren't just applicable to open source projects. They are applicable to any other software development. When we started doing, we do a lot of client work, uh, of course, with Node and of course with JavaScript. And when we started this, and the first thing we do is set up semantic release because we just, like this is, like we don't want to go back. I, for me personally, using these tools and a bunch of the other process that we're doing is like going from subversion to Git or like going from version folders to Git, right? It is that much of a paradigm shift. Um, so we're using this for commercial projects everywhere, and it's really, really good. Um, but this is also part of a larger story. Um, it's not just that the things that I talked about today, there's a lot more going on in the modularization space, and again, trade-offs to be made. Um, but in general, in open source as well, everybody starts using GitHub, um, everybody goes to the pull request model because that's a really nice asynchronous way of working together efficiently instead of having like meetings every evening where we merge stuff. This is what enterprise development can look like. Right? It's, really, it's a really a new way of doing software. Um, and in fact, um, there's a movement called inner source to take all the best practices and tools that we know from the open source and provide it for the enterprise in a way that they, um, that they can use it better. And the goal is to replace the arcane um, enterprise development practices that usually involve some Java from the 90s. Um, and I know some of you work in these places or even have something to say in these places that are in this audience. Um, so definitely look into this. This is a, like, a cross-project and cross-vendor initiative. There's a free book from PayPal of all things. Um, there's an official cooperation between GitHub, NPM, Travis, Coveralls, and Greenkeeper. We have a, like, a demo installation for enterprise that can look at this. Um, so you can, like, everyone can get started with all the benefits that we learned from the open source project. Um, and not everyone does this, but like services like, like Travis, uh, GitHub, and Greenkeeper as well, they of course provide a huge benefit to the open source project. So the more enterprises uh, give us lots of money, the, the more features we can build for the open source community. So I hope this is a fair deal. In conclusion, I hope you learned a lot about automating your development workflows um, with NPM, Semantic Release, and Greenkeeper. And like us, see a significant boost in your productivity. But most importantly, so you can focus on the things that you, the humans working on the code, are really good at. Um, again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak at JS Congress, and I wish you a very, rest, a very great rest of the day. And thank you for listening.